tension between the US and Iran sparked following tanker attacks in Strait of Hormuz. As Washington blamed Tehran for the incident, Iran shot down a US surveillance drone. Neither Iran nor any other hostile actor should mistake US prudence and discretion for weakness. No one has granted them a hunting license in the Middle East. Iran is also following up with hardline retaliatory measures against the US. به این سادگی در مقابل اینها سرخم نخواهم کرد و نخواهیم کرد و ایستادیم و به این راحتی سرخم نمیکنیم و آمریکا و یاد دارو دستش بدانم. The conflict has entered into a deeper phase with the US imposing additional sanctions on Iran. The assets of Ayatollah Khomeini and his office will not be spared from the sanctions. These measures represent a strong and proportionate response to Iran's increasingly provocative action. As the possibility of the U.S.-Iran conflict developing into a war mounts, the rest of the world is paying attention to the heightening tensions between the two countries. Why? Welcome to our program, The Point for World Affairs. I'm your host, Daniel Che. On our show, we delve a little deeper into the stories making headlines around the world. Today, our first topic is the escalating tension between the U.S. and Iran. So, let's get to the point in the studio. So, I just want to say... Today we're joined by Yi Hyun, professor of law from Handong University, here with us in the studio to help us dissect the stories into digestible bites. Thank you so much for making time for us. It's good to be here. Well, our first topic of the day is the tension escalating between the U.S. and Iran. An American surveillance drone was shot down, and that was adding fuel to the fire as well. Some fear the two sides could be on the brink of war. Right. I think this is a very difficult situation uh, between the two sides. Uh, there's certainly been escalation, but I suspect that both sides don't want a war. And so I think there will be de-escalation soon afterwards, uh, given the rhetoric of the two sides. But I think, suspect that there will be some tensions, but then there will be a de-escalation of the conflict. And then both sides will come to the table at some point, I think. Right. Uh, Trump is, as always, putting up his Trump card, which is the maximum pressure card, choking Iran on all fronts, especially economically. Uh, Washington was 10 minutes away from striking Iran, uh, striking Tehran, apparently, uh, but added that Trump was boasting how he canceled it last minute. Uh, how do you read into uh, this uh, uh, gesture by President Donald Trump, who actually was the one who decided the attack and then mm. decided he was the one who neutralized it? Right. I think... President Trump is not, I think, someone who wants to engage in conflicts. I think he has isolationist tendencies. And so I think there's a debate within his administration between those who are more hawkish and those who are more dovish. And I think his instinct is not to actually attack other nations, but is to withdraw the United States' involvement in some of these areas. But I think what you're seeing here is his ability to potentially go to the brink and then pull back in, in the hopes of getting a deal in this kind of situation. Right, a very uh, skilled game of ch uh, checkers or maybe chess mm -hmm. by President Donald Trump. And some experts are s saying that he may be calling for low-profile cyber attacks, what some experts would call a shadow war. That's right. I think this is the kind of situation, I think, particularly in the 21st century, where we see in the information age and this idea of cyber warfare. And I, I think this is the term that they use as a shadow war. It's a, it's a war you can't see, but it's, it's fought in the shadows. But it's a, really, it's a real conflict. And I think the United States has advanced itself in terms of establishing this kind of warfare in the future. And I think for the Persian Gulf region, and this is going to be a very sensitive topic going forward because this is going to be a conflict that's going to assess how effective cyber warfare will be, particularly in the Persian Gulf region. And Iran responded by saying that they 
are vowing to scale down its compliance with the 2015 nuclear uh, deal. Uh, what does this mean, scaling down commitment to the agreement from Iran's stance? Well, as you noted, in 2015, the, the P5 plus one agreement uh, between the permanent five members of the Security Council and, and Germany uh, were trying to coax Iran into reducing its uranium stockpiles. Uh, and when President Trump came into office, he, he decried the, the deal as being a bad deal, uh, as well as siding with the Israelis on this point. And so the United States announced its withdrawal from the deal, and the, now the Iranians are threatening to now uh, pull out of the deal by violating the terms of the agreement. And so currently the agreement calls for, I think, 300 kilograms of uranium. Uh, but I think by the end of this month and going forward, they're going to exceed that amount. And so I think in their, from their perspective, they're going to wait and see whether or not the Europeans will uh, bridge the gap with respect to uh, the, the sanctions, but they will, I think, threaten to pull out the agreement altogether. Iran certainly seems uh, unfazed, at least the leadership seems unfazed by this pressure. Uh, instead, uh, they're eager to fight back with uh, uh, Hassan Rouhani, even going out to use uh, what some would say um, vocabulary from Trump's dictionary, uh, like uh, mental issues that Washington is experiencing in terms of the latest decision. That's right. The, the Iranians, I think, want to stand up to Trump, and they want, don't want to be seen as being weak, particularly within the region. They have other pressures in the area. Saudi Arabia, of course, is, is a big concern for the Iranians, as well as other players in the region. And so they certainly want to be strong in front of that group of people, but also uh, within a domestic audience is very curious about how this administration is going to respond to the United States. And as we briefly touched on, uh, Iran is, of course, unfazed by American pressure, visibly. And in fact, they're eager to fight back, as clearly evidenced by this particular scene from the nation's parliament on June 24th. Here's the short footage. دستش بدانند که ایران ما و کشور ما به این سادگی در مقابل تهدیدهای اونها تسلیم نخواهد شد و تا پای جان این ساده ایم به مقاومت خواهیم کرد Not unlike the tone set by their president, it seems like uh, uh, they are eager uh, to uh, put their guards up at the moment. Uh, Washington announced new economic sanctions against Tehran. Uh, this is something that they plan to carry out while conducting uh, the shadow war that we touched upon earlier. President Trump appears almost uh, obsessed with uh, freezing Iran's assets. Why is that so? Mm. I think short of pursuing a military solution to this problem, I think what the Trump administration is trying to do is disincentivize Iran from pursuing nuclear weapons. I think everyone assumes that, nu that Iran wants nuclear weapons, but Trump wants to put maximum pressure short of a military option uh, to convince Iran that this is not a good choice. Now, it remains to be seen whether or not Iran will actually follow through with respect to not pursuing nuclear weapons. But I think many in the intelligence community, I think around the world, they really believe that, nu that nuclear weapons are in Iran's future. And the question is, when will that happen and how much can the United States affect Iran's policy on this particular issue? Speaking of nuclear weapons, how different is it uh, when we're looking at Iran compared to North Korea in terms of the scale and potential of uh, their capabilities? I think Iran is certainly a richer nation. Uh, it's more technologically advanced. It has a lot of resources. And I think for the United States, uh, Iran is, is going to be the focus. I think North Korea certainly is a problem, but that's a problem I think that's limited to the region, particularly for China and Japan. But Iran poses, I think, a big threat to the United States because of Islamic terrorism, I think other issues that arise in the region, and because Iran is such a large nation. Uh, I think that's the focus of the United States with respect to denuclearization, potentially. And Iran isn't as uh, dearly dependent on nuclear uh, prowess as North Korea is. Mm -hmm. That's one thing for sure. Well, we're going to put you on hold for now, uh, Professor Lee, and we are now going to connect live via Skype uh, to another expert to talk about this issue, a local expert, that is. We're joined by Jared Blank, Senior Fellow at Carnegie Endowment for International Peace. Hello there. Hi, thanks very much for having me. Thank you very much for being here with us. Uh, the U.S. could actively engage in a shadow war with Iran by conducting covert operations and cyber attacks instead of carrying out military strikes. Also, there are signs that a war may be imminent, according to some. How is the American public responding to these developments? 
I think that the American public has made very clear over the course of repeated elections that it is tired of foreign adventurism. And you, know, you saw that, quite frankly, George W. Bush in 2000 ran against what was then perceived to be President Clinton's excessive involvement in the Balkans. Uh, President Obama ran in 2008 against President George W. Bush's uh, adventurous attitudes after 9-11. And of course, President Trump ran on an America First platform. So it's very, very clear to me that on Iran and across the board, the American public are not looking for wars. Will Washington impose additional sanctions on Tehran? How do you assess this particular move? The sanctions that were imposed yesterday are symbolic in nature. Uh, they're targeting individuals and institutions, the Supreme Leader, the Supreme Leader's office, uh, some military leaders of the Iranian Revolutionary, the Islamic Revolutionary Guard Corps, who are not likely to have any substantial assets abroad and who are not likely to have any transparent links to the international financial system. So unlike all of the sanctions that were posed with the reimposition of the, the when, when the United States withdrew from the JCPOA, these are not going to have practical macroeconomic effects. Um, the, the problem is not that they're symbolic. Symbolism can be useful in international affairs. The problem is that the message that they're delivering, or rather the messages that they're delivering, are all pretty dumb. So I think they're sending a fairly clear message that whatever President Trump says, he's actually pursuing a regime change policy. A fairly clear message that the administration is not serious about, is not prepared to seek a diplomatic resolution to the current crisis. And finally, a message that we're running out of substantial economic measures to use, I think something that a lot of Iranians had already presumed to be true, which means that if President Trump wants to continue responding in a tit-for-tat way the way he did yesterday, it's going to be harder and harder for him to, withdraw, to avoid military force as opposed to kind of coercive economic all right, thank you so much for your insights, Jared. We appreciate it. Now, despite stepping up retaliatory measures against Iran, Washington hinted at a possible dialogue with Tehran. In fact, President Trump sent a message to Iran's Supreme Leader Ayatollah Ali Khamenei in an interview. This is what he had to say. I'm not looking for war. And if there is, it'll be obliteration like you've never seen before. But I'm not looking to do that. But you can't have a nuclear weapon. You want to talk good, otherwise you can have a bad economy no for the next three years. N not as far as I'm concerned, no preconditions. And you'll talk anyway? Here it is, look. You can't have nuclear weapons. And if you want to talk about it, good. Otherwise, you can live in a shattered economy for a long time to come. America's VP, Mike Pence, uh, said that the U.S. is willing to hold talks without preconditions, but then he also added that all options remain, remain on the table. So it seems like we are not going to see the tension simmering down anytime soon, it seems. The United States policy on, think, on this matter is, I think, very clear. Uh, they don't want to see nuclear weapons in Iran, uh, but they also don't want to see a military conflict. And so this is the catch-22 when it comes to Iran, is you hear you have a very powerful country, uh, yet who wants, seems to want to have nuclear weapons. Uh, so the United States is going to try to ramp up the pressure as, as much as possible, short of a military option. Uh, but that, of course, can lead to other kinds of problems. And I think this is where there has to be a lot of wisdom by both sides in terms of how to approach the topic with each other. And I think there's possible for miscommunication, for uh, mistakes that can happen, as you, we saw in the, in the Strait of Hormuz. Uh, and those kinds of things can certainly escalate the situation to a military situation. But I think uh, cooler heads will hopefully prevail in this situation and that we won't see an actual military conflict. Right. Is there a need for the international community to do more, step up and uh, take part in this conversation to extend it to uh, a bigger forum for the rest of the world? I think certainly the Europeans want to do that. Uh, but I think where you have the United States involved as a superpower, uh, you're going to have the difficulties with respect to uh, playing off these different powers against each other. And the United States, I think, wants to be in the driver's seat on this issue. And so despite the Europeans' efforts to try to allay the, and calm the situation down, I think it's really essentially up to the Iranians and the United States. Right. Well, there are some question marks and uh, concerns about uh, America's drastic move. But then also some are saying that Trump deserved some props for engaging with Iran in the first place instead of playing somewhat of a strategic patience card. Right. 
I think that's that that's remains to be seen in terms of the long term. But certainly, uh, the President Trump's instincts on this kind of issue, I think, uh, is a marked contrast to past administrations. And sure. while the voices of the hawks and doves will continue to echo at the Oval Office. Mm -hmm. Well, Professor Lee, it's time for us to move on to our next issue. Before we start discussions on the matter, let's uh, roll the clip first. The opposition candidate Ekrem Imamoglu has clinched the Istanbul mayoral election, which was held for the second time in three months. Sizler, Türkiye'nin demokrasi itibarını tüm dünyanın gözleri önünde korudunuz. Yüz yıl aşan demokrasi geleneğimize milletçe sahip çıktınız. Teşekkürler İstanbul'la hemşerilerim. When Imamoglu, who represented opposition CHP, won the initial mayoral election on March 31st, Turkish President Recep Tayyip Erdogan and the ruling party have pushed for the vote to be annulled, calling for a fresh election. The ruling Justice and Development Party candidate Binali Yildirim has accepted his defeat with nearly all votes counted, while President Erdogan took to Twitter to congratulate Imamoglu's victory. He also said the national will has manifested the result. Halk yerini buldu bence. Hak edilmiş bir seçim tekrarlanmak zorunda kaldı ve halk bence cevabını verdi. Since Erdogan won the mayoral election in 1994, Istanbul remained as the Turkish president's political stronghold and was run by the ruling party for the last 25 years. The stunning victory provides a glimpse of hope for a different era for Turkish politics and instantly makes Imamoglu a rising challenger against Erdogan in the upcoming presidential election. Istanbul, it is where the ruling party, the AK party, has uh, ran the city for a quarter of a century. And they take pr great pride in that and it's also where uh, the current president Erdogan started his political career. So it's a uh, devastating blow to the ruling party that they lost the election twice. It's quite shocking actually if you think about it. Uh, he's been in power for 25 years, particularly in Istanbul, his base. And for him to lose there I think really shows real cracks in potentially the future for his party, for himself personally. And I think this is going to mark potentially a great shift in Turkish politics. But the big question I guess would be is this uh, a support of Imamulu or a strong voice of opposition against Erdogan? It's probably a combination of different factors. And if you believe the, the idea that all politics is local, then whatever he, Imamoglu, ran on, uh, re relieving the traffic conditions in, in Istanbul or uh, dealing with the refugee problem in the city, I think certainly people are in favor of those things and they appeal to the local voters. But I think there's also the other issue of national, the national economy. Uh, there, the, Turkey is in a deep recession, uh, there's inflation, uh, there's rampant unemployment, and so this may be a referendum on the economy as much as it is uh, the local uh, election for this particular mayor. There is, there has been a strong support to Erdogan and there still is apparently after the election when they held interviews with the uh, regular Jews, uh, they, some of them still believe in Erdogan and it seems like both sides, the AK party and the opposition, claim to be the champion uh, to defend democracy. Right, and this is the, the, the complex nature of this, this question with respect to Turkey, is that you have the AK party which has been in power for a long time and Turkey has flourished uh, in, in some ways with respect to their economy, their national standing, and so a lot of people are in support of Erdogan and the party. But I think there's a lot of growing discontent and, and I think if you've been in power for that long, you're going to see a lot of issues that come up, uh, corruption. Uh, you're going to see the desire for a fresh voice, a, a younger person to get into office. And so I think all of those factors combined uh, make this particular election really interesting for Erdogan and, and going forward. Well, clearly the people want something new and fresh and they are showing some discontent with the government. And now we, let's, uh, let us just take a deep dive into this matter by turning to another expert uh, to listen to his take on this matter, a reflection from the inside if you might call it. Here's what Yi Hee Su, a professor of cultural anthropology from Hanyang University, told us about how the Turkish public felt about this election. Uh, 
그 부정부패 일소 투명성 이런 면에서 혁명적인 성과를 거두어서 사실은 터키 역사상 처음으로 이제 장기 집권이 가능했는데요. 그러나 이런 어, 정권이 장기화 되다 보니까 이제 최근 들어서는 이제 권력의 집중 또 민주화 이제 언론의 자유 어떤 대학이 폐쇄되는 이런 상태에서 어떤 비민주화 또 언론에 대한 통제 또 학문의 자유가 이제, 가, 이제 손상된 데 대해서 이제 큰 이제 우려와 걱정을 이제 끼쳐드리는 상, 상태였어요. 아무리 표수가 적다 하더라도 그 미니의 그 대변이기 때문에 그걸 수긍하는 것이 어떤 민주주의의 원칙이었는데 어, 그것이 무효화되면서 이제 유권자들의 이 반발이나 우려가 컸고 그것이 이제 어, 6월 23일 선거에서 그 독재나 군의주의 또 이슬람 회기에 대한 이 걱정과 우려가 야당 대표에게 훨씬 더큰 표차로 어, 당선시켜 주게 하는 어, 민심이 이제 표출된 것 같습니다. So uh, the, the Turkish people could hope for an economic rebound with the new mayor in charge of the capital. The election result could also work as a possible ripple effect. Some may think that this could even lead to Erdogan's impeachment because after all, Erdogan started out in Istanbul and rose to power and the same could be expected from Imamoglu. I think one election is not going to change the electoral, electoral map of, of, of Turkey. Uh, Turkey is essentially a centralized state. And uh, Erdogan has a lot of power, of course, within Turkey, and he can cut off funding to Istanbul if he wanted to. Uh, but if he does that, of course, then Imamoglu looks better, uh, potentially. And so because of the stark contrast between himself, Erdogan, and Imamoglu, uh, this could really present a real problem for Erdogan going forward. Uh, people are talking already about Imamoglu being a presidential candidate, depending on how he does in Istanbul. But I think also there's a problem for uh, Erdogan also within his own party. I think you're beginning to see cracks within this party itself, and there may be talk of people leaving the party to form a new faction. And so I think for Erdogan, this is going to be something that he's going to have to manage very carefully if he wants to continue to stay in power. Imam Ulu ran with this campaign slogan, everything will be fine. It certainly looks like he opened a door for a change. We will have to wait and see if he is the man to walk through it and spearhead some necessary changes in the time to come. Uh, Professor E, we appreciate you coming in and making our program complete today. Yeah, thank you for having me. So, I just want to say... Step away. Very good. Oh. Before we wrap things up, there are more headline-grabbing stories developing around the world as we speak. So let's turn our attention to some of them. Presidents Moon Jae-in of South Korea and Donald Trump of the U.S. expressed optimism that a meeting with North Korea's Kim Jong-un at the DMZ Sunday would speed up the denuclearization process. Speaking shortly after the eighth Moon Trump summit, 오늘 평화로 가는 방법을 한반도가 증명할 수 있게 되어 저는 매우 마음이 벅찹니다. 지속적인 대화는 한반도의 완전한 비핵화를 이루는 현실성이 있는 유일한 방법입니다. The historic and impromptu meeting between North Korean leader Kim Jong-un and U.S. President Donald Trump took place at the Truce Village of Panmunjom on Sunday. After touring the demilitarized zone with President Moon Jae-in, President Trump walked to the military demarcation line that divides the two Koreas. There, just like during the first inter-Korean summit in April 2018, Kim Jong-un greeted Trump at the border, saying how he never expected to see President Trump there. Kim then took Trump to the northern side, making him the first U.S. president to set foot on North Korean soil. After a brief photo shoot, the two crossed over to the South Korean side, exchanging brief comments on the surprise meeting. Yeah. 
남다른 용단의 그 노래라고 생각합니다. I just want to say that uh, this is my honor. I didn't really expect it. We were in Japan for the G20. We came over and I said, "Hey, I'm over here. I want to call Chairman Kim." And we got to meet and uh, stepping across that line was a great honor. A lot of progress has been made. President Trump also said they liked each other from day one and that he would invite Kim to the White House right now. The two leaders were then joined by South Korean President Moon Jae-in, and this marked another historic moment as the three leaders finally all met together. Though the details could not be heard, the leaders got to enjoy about four minutes of three-way talks standing at the symbolic place of peace. The leaders of North Korea and the U.S. then moved to the Freedom House on the South Korean side to hold their de facto third bilateral meeting, which lasted for 53 minutes. <laughs> At a quick briefing after the meeting, President Trump said both sides agreed to resume working level talks soon. So we've agreed to have teams set up. I'm, we're going to have the United States will have a team. Uh, Secretary of State Pompeo will pick it. We already know the gentleman. Good luck, Steve. Thanks, sir. That's all the stories we have brought with us for you today. For more, do join us again same time next week for a brand new episode of The Point World Affairs. Thank you so much for watching.